And uh, this is the sharing after the conference. So uh, my wife asked me, well, are you letting down from the conference yet? And I said, I don't know why. I just don't feel like I am. And then I realized I'm, st I'm still going. <laughs> you know, Nothing's actually changed for me, just the size of the group. But that's, that's all. <clears throat> all right, so we're, we've been in... Uh, Genesis, and, and in the last session of the conference, I had to sort of cheat a little bit for the sake of four people who didn't want to leave the conference feeling we are. But the truth is, we're not really ready to get out of the ark yet. Uh, we're getting soon, but we're not quite ready. And uh, so uh, what I want to do is continue on that. Instead of... Uh, well, if you've got, if you did turn to Genesis, might maybe you can save your place there. But uh, uh, I want to go to a scripture that I didn't really comment much on, <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians four. verse 16 to the end of the chapter. How about just a little bit more? Well, we can just do that. That's good. Thank you. All right. It says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And that right there could be seen in light of the ark because... Um, in the flood, there was just a general judgment. But in the ark, there's two things going on. There's a resurrection and a death. There is an outward perishing and an inward renewing. And this, this shows that those two things are going on at the exact same time. And this is, this is basically what the ark is about. And it goes on, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That is not cruise control. What I mean by cruise control is that is not automatic. That only happens while we look not at the things which are seen. Anybody here have a problem looking at circumstances and people and actions and living based on the earth and sort of not living life but reacting to life <clears throat> while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal in other words we're being moved by things that uh, that are being moved hmm they're being moved by the eternal. We're being moved by the temporal. <clears throat> and all the movement of go that's going on in God's plan is working toward the eternal, but we're being moved by the temporal, and we're seeing this, and we're seeing that, and we're reacting instead of acting, instead of living the life of Christ. We're reacting to situations and circumstances. And I believe, this is, this is my belief, and, you know, but I believe that Noah in the ark for much of his time was reacting. He was, uh, you ever heard the squeaky wheel gets the grease? I bet there's a lot of squeak, squeaking going on. <clears throat> and, um, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, as in his case or in our case, <clears throat> while we're focused on the present issues, the, the, the present issue, and that's all they are is issues, and, and Noah, while he was focused on the present issues within the ark, there's no way that Noah was seeing the destruction that the cross of the judgment had taken place. He was seeing what? You know, he wasn't seeing what was accomplished. He was only seeing the situation of what is alive and what is in his face at this very moment. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, outside, there's this incredible judgment where everything is dead. But inside, and, and I wanted to explain this a little more so we'll get into it this session. Um, but inside, there is, and I will say it like this, there is the appearance of what is alive when it is not truly alive. And, 
And the only way to fully understand that is when you step out of the ark and into the new creation. Because there the explanation begins to come, and we'll, we will get into that. So, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of times when you are seeing all these issues or you're seeing these beasts that are alive, this hyena is laughing at you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> there he goes right now, see. You, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but there is hope. Because when God shuts you into the ark, I mean, you know, let's face it. There is hope when he shuts you in because he's saving you from the judgment. But there's also hope when he shuts you in because he gives us hope. Just, you know, remember Jeremiah? Jeremiah was shut up in the prison. Do you remember that? And he was shut up and he, could, he, he was bound and held in that place. But... While he was shut up, while he was in prison, God spoke to him and said something like this. Obviously, this is my paraphrase. He said, you know the land that I told you would be judged? You know the people that would be wiped off the land and the land would be untilled and everything? I want you to go buy, go buy a piece of it. Now, if you're thinking, this is all judged. There's no hope. It's over with you would question that and go, why? Why would I want to throw my money away on a worthless piece? And he's going, no, 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 no. The judgment is going to be over with, and you will come into a whole new thing with me in relationship to the land. And so, um, as I said before, the cocoon is not the end, but you can't tell that to the caterpillar because he thinks it is. Everything within him feels like I, I'm coming to an end of everything in a, in a very negative way. <clears throat> and, you know, you can see that in the situation of the Passover with Israel. <clears throat> um, he was, God was to Israel. He was both the Lord of judgment and he was also the Lord who brought them out. I mean, there was judgment going on, and yet he was bringing out also. I mean, his whole thing, I mean, the very moment while he's pronouncing judgment uh, on the land, he is dressing them to move. Do you remember what he said? Have your shoes on. When you eat this Passover, have your shoes on, your staff in your hand, and everything like that. So, you know, so in other words, judgment is all around, uh, but God dresses them as if, their life would go on. What is, now those are just examples from the scriptures. How do we translate that into modern day situations? Sometimes when God deals with us, it's very harsh. Uh, for example, put Noah for, and somebody said to me, so Noah was in the ark for 156 days. You need to keep reading. It was, that was true, but there was much more that was going on after that period of time. He was uh, in there approximately 371 days, so that's over a year. And, you know, you're put in these situations. What situations? Situations that are uncomfortable for your flesh. Who does that? The devil. No, God is the one who's doing that. God puts you in those situations. Why? Because he wants to bring forth Christ in you. And when Jesus is brought forth, you will learn another kind of comfort. You will learn another kind of peace. You will learn another kind of tranquility. And that comes from having a life that is not ruffled the way our life is. Having a nature that is not ruffled the way our nature is. Well then what's the point of all that? The point of all that is that God knows, God knows this, we don't. God knows that Jesus in you is the only hope you got. He really knows that. You know, he knew that before the world began. And he knows what it's going to take to help you. And that's the, that's the key right there, to help you. 
to help you overcome. Because let's face it, there are things that bother the flesh that didn't bother Jesus. Jesus could, you know, Jesus could be asleep in the boat in the middle of a storm when everyone else is freaking out. And when they freak out because the outward things are wrong or negative, their insides freak out. Master, carest thou not? In other words, simply the storm that came up on the outside brought a storm on the inside. And they started freaking out. And the freak out wasn't, you know, Lord, wake up and paddle harder. The freak out was... You don't care about us. Anybody ever felt that way? That the Lord doesn't care about you? That, that if he cared about you, why would you be in this situation? You know. Uh, I, I'm sure kids ask that. You know. If, if you care about me, why are you spanking me? If you care about me, why are you correcting me? And it's hard to explain. If you, you know, you're doing something on a greater level and the kid comes up and says, would you do this for me right now? Would you do this? And you say, no, I'm, I'm doing, you know, for example, fixing a meal. And they're, want, they're going, would you, you know, come in here and play soldiers with me? You know, no, I can't do it right now. What, you don't love me? Okay, come on, why don't you care? You know, you know, everything. I do care, I'm doing something bigger. But they cannot, and I say they, we, cannot seem to catch the bigger picture until you get a certain level of maturity. Then someone explains, you go, oh, sure, you know, yeah, you're fixing the meal for all of us. You're working hard. Thank you for doing that. You know, this can wait. But a child, or uh, the, uh, the word in the New Testament is tiknon, one who is yet immature, you can't explain that to them. They want answers on a level that the Lord really isn't trying to give answers on. All right. So, um, you know, uh, so God brings about a situation. And in that situation, we're freaking out and we're looking at the, the situation and this looks bad. This looks like it, things are going really, really bad. <clears throat> but in the midst of that, somehow the Lord comes to you, or the Lord speaks to you, or the Lord gives you some sort of sense of peace in him. Maybe it only lasts for an hour. Maybe it only lasts for a few minutes. Maybe, you know. But that's him giving you assurance that I, it's like the Lord saying, I'm dressing you even though judgment's at the door. I'm dressing you to leave this place. And that's what he did with Israel. So, um, now, you have, the other, you have the other side of that. Some people are so focused on their problems and stuff that they're always freaking out. But it's also possible for some people, more or less, to basically just uh, ignore their own issues and problems and simply hold doctrinally to the death of Christ, and particularly just referring that to Adam or the old nature. You understand what I'm saying? The old man is dead. Are you, here's my question, are you ignoring the real thing that God's trying to do in your life by embracing a doctrine as an answer? I believe it's, I've been around a long time, people preaching this, okay, 40 years. I mean, I've seen it all. I haven't seen it all, but I've seen a lot. And I've seen that this is a very true thing that they hold to this death. And the thing that gives them courage to go on is, least we're in the ark. And they ignore all the madness going, in and, or going on in the ark while they hold to the fact that everyone else died and I'm in, I'm in Christ. And I've seen that so many times. And folks, the purpose of the ark is to confront you to such a degree that it will be, listen, irrefutable evidence that you need Jesus 
so, so clear cut and powerful that you will never believe to the contrary, even when things get better. <laughs> you know? That even when you're doing good and things are doing good, your breath, you're breathing out this I need Jesus. Why? Because the beast in you has arisen? No. You don't have to have a present arising anymore. You can get out, as it were, and walk around in the good land and say, as long as it's Christ, I'm okay. But if I revert back, is it possible to revert back? Well, you know, Paul said Demas did it. It's possible for people to learn the depth of Christ and go right back to what they were before they ever met Jesus. How does that happen? You leave the one, number one principle of it all. You make little issues, this, this, and that, not the issue. And I'm telling you, God has one issue. Is it Christ? And he'll never leave that basis. That's what he always holds to and adheres to. But we, we leave that and then we start going, well, there's this and there's that and there's this. And, you know, then it's, it's all temporal issues. While we look, we faint not while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. Okay. If the outward man is perishing, that's something you can see. If the inward man is perishing, that's something that is eternal that you're going to have to lift up your eyes and focus on. In other words, you're going to have to be with the Lord through this. You can't ask the Lord to be with you. What's the difference? Being with the Lord is in the eternal. Him being with you is in the temporal. Can I get amen? Because that is the truth. And most Christians' relationship with the Lord is to get him involved in their temporal. Well, even if you get him involved in it, this scripture says that the reason why we won't faint is if we're not involved in the temporal, but even if God's involved in our temporal, we will still find a reason to faint. We will. I mean, we, folks, we're pretty pitiful. We really are. We're pretty pitiful. And we need to be made aware of that. So we say, thank God for the ark. Thank God for the burial. Thank God for the bridge between death and resurrection. Because if God turned me loose in the new creation without the ark, it would be bad. Because I would be taking all that God did for me or through me and making that some sort of a proof that I'm spiritual. Now, that happens all the time in nominal Christianity, where when God, if God moves through them or for them, that to them is a proof that they are spiritual. When the scripture says the Lord allows his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. You know, those aren't the signs of spirituality. The sign of spirituality is Christ and the cross. You want a sign, Jesus said, I will give you the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. That's burial. <laughs> That's burial. That's burial. And so, uh, I, don't, I don't, maybe I did mention it, but, you know, it's that situation where, where Ezekiel experienced it and John did in the book of Revelation where the angel of the Lord was standing there and he had the book, you know, and he said to Ezekiel or he said to John, take the book. And, of course, we want to take it and read it. He says, take it and eat it. Take the book and get it on the inside of you. Mm, get it in there. Get it in there feeding you. And, and part of who you are becoming the very substance, the, uh, the word of God becoming the very substance of who you are and stuff like this. But when he tasted it, he said, mm, this tastes good. But when it hit its belly, that place where digestion starts happening, 
Oh, oh, it's just bitter in my stomach. You know, when it comes to living it, it's not fun. Well, the, the deal is, is when you first begin to hear the message of Christ and him crucified, it's pretty exciting. And you've got a choice. You've got a choice. You can leave Egypt and go after that. And it can be an 11-day journey, and that's what the scriptures say. It was 11 days from Sinai, I guess it was, to, to the promised land. 11 days or 40 years. Okay. <clears throat> it does not have to take 40 years. It does not have to take as long as many people think that it does. They are dragging their feet. They are... Um, they and you know and I understand so I'm not there is no condemnation in what I'm saying it's just this reality that they they when the thing finally hits their stomach and is no longer an issue of the mouth they don't like the ark they don't like the burial the burial is absolutely necessary the ark is incredibly important there is no getting it's like you know the the Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheepfold. You know, a thief comes to try to get in another way. Let me tell you, this is the way to get in, but everyone's trying to sneak in some other way to avoid that part of the cross, that part of the death and burial, so that they can, you know, you know, not, exp you know, it's kind of like not experience the scars. Paul said that. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Jesus bears in his body the mark. Where you bear the, you know, you, many of you remember in time past I would reach up and touch the rope burns and go, hey, I don't think I want to do that again. You know, I remember, man, I was dancing at the end of that rope and, you know, uh, and I deserved it, you know. I was, I was thinking about that uh, when I was writing the thing on the cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree and I was thinking about how in the western days when you did something wrong, you stole someone's cattle or something like that, they got a rope and threw it over a tree limb and hung you on a tree. You were cursed and you were done publicly like that and they said, you know, you are cursed. You know, there is this reality that we need to go through that part of the death into the burial and then come out on the other side with Christ being the resurrection and the life and the life so um, let's uh, let's look in Acts chapter 10 real quick just had a thought about something that uh, Acts 10 Verse, uh, well, it starts in verse 9. It's the deal, the thing with Peter and the, the vision of the sheep and all that. Um, let's just read 10 through nah, for a while here. And he became very hungry, this time about Peter, and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, in which were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. <clears throat> um, In other words, we believe in the, the cross for us. We believe in the cross for us, but we condemn others. We say, you're unclean. Uh, and uh, that can become fixed in your doctrine where people who have not embraced the cross in our particular way are rejected. And I'm going to tell you something that I, I you know, I guess almost every session I say, well, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'm going to tell you something I'll uh, probably get in trouble for. This is, and it's a terrible thing. 
I believe salvation is a free gift, and it's by grace. I know, I know. And I believe that anyone who accepts Jesus' death and the grace of God that comes with it is saved and born again. And they don't have to believe everything I know. And, and one of the things that so, sometimes when you get into this message is that you want everybody, you expect everybody to believe to the measure that you believe or to know to the measure that you know. Well, that's just ridiculous. That is just totally ridiculous. God wants each and every person to walk with the Lord where they're at and to gain the relationship that they have with the Lord, not the relationship I have with the Lord or you know, some other person that we've lifted up higher above than what they ought to have been lifted up, that what we have, but we hear somebody, and, you know, it's good to have teachers. I mean, I think it's a great thing. But I tell you what, when I sit under somebody teaching, I don't, and especially if it's somebody that's, that I, has known the Lord longer than I have, I don't try to get everything that they share. I try to get what the Holy Spirit wants me to get. That's all that's really important. And to gain anything else is me parroting back something I heard, and it's not life anyway, and we are proliferating something that's going to die eventually because we're, we're sowing the seeds of death into it. Each one of us need to know the Lord on the level that we know, and if it's life to you, I mean, Steve comes to me all the time and shares with me what the Lord's doing in his life and stuff. And I just think, man, that is so precious. And, and, it, and it's so full of life when he shares. I'm so happy when he shares, you know, because I know that, that he's walking with the Lord where he's at. And he's not trying to impress me with knowledge or whatever. He's loving Jesus, you know. And... Um, I mean, I remember when I worked for Denton State School. It's been a lot of years now, but I used to work for Denton State School. And, and uh, I remember one of my first thoughts was I've got, I'm, I was a teacher in a classroom, and I had, you know, 22 students, something like that. And I remember thinking, how am I going to reach these kids for the Lord? They, you know, they don't hardly understand anything. And then, you know, it just came to me, uh, you don't do this by your mind, you do it by your spirit. And I did end up leading many of them to the Lord. Well, they could never know what I know, you know. Um, but they could know Jesus. All right, the reason why I said this would probably get me in trouble is because, well, that opens the door wide open for fellowship. See, we're not, we're not the closed brethren. We're the open brethren. And, um, you know, I love Jesus whether I see him in a person that's just, you know, you know, 100 years of walking with the Lord or two days. I'm going to take that away and eat every bit of that. <laughs> okay, on three, open it real fast. One, two, three, go. All right. Now I know why J.W. did what he did. When we were Bible school students, Deb was sitting there chewing gum. I think this before I knew you. We weren't even sitting together. And he's, yeah, and he said, he's teaching, and he stopped me. He said, young lady, are you chewing gum? And, you know, the whole class, you know, J.W.'s voice. And she went, yes, sir. He said, swallow it right now. So if we can't be quiet with this, I'm going to take it up. <laughs> All right. Um, and I, I'd mentioned in the conference this, this scripture in Galatians 6.14 um, where, you know, we glory that, you know, you're, you're crucified. I mean, not that you're that someone else's, but that you're dead because you're outside the ark. That's kind of the way we look at them because they're not with us in the ark. You're dead. And uh, that's not the, that is not the cross or the crucifixion we're supposed to be glorying in. He said, I glory that the world is crucified to me. That means all of them out there died. And he said, and I'm crucified to it. That's where it really counts. But you're not going to gain that. You're not going to gain that 
until you're in the ark. The ark uh, is the place where you finally lay hold of that reality. Well, who wants to be locked in with all these beasts? Come on. But folks, we're locked in with them anyway. He's just put us in a situation where we'll finally see them. The beasts were there all the time. We just didn't see it because we were too busy blaming everybody else's beasts. And that is the truth. I mean, we go, well, you've got, you know, I mean, it's like this. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, a hyena and a, and a jackal, you know. And we see this jackal reaction out of somebody. And we react to them with our hyena. And we go, thank God I don't have no jackal in me. No, you don't. But you got a hyena. <laughs> you know? And it's, you know, I mean, the, the point is, is that all the beasts are there. And you've, and, you've, and you've sort of let certain ones come forth in you. And they've let certain other ones. And they've let certain other ones. But they're all rejects they're all rejected by the cross they're all meant for death and Christ is meant to be the one who lives in us so they've got a task of getting rid of their beasts and you got a task but you'll never know how bad they are in you until you're locked in with them shut in with them that's just all there is to it and there's just no way around it and it's it's not pretty and this is this is a great teaching if you're not there but if you are there, it's not a real joyful realization, and yet it's not forever. And I will say this, as much as in me and as much as I know, which may not be very much, but it sure is worth it to get through that and to know for sure he's the only one, I'm not, and, you know, there's no good thing in me, and that's not just, that's not a poor self-image statement because you know you can make that out of out of poor self-image well nothing good in me but jesus you know yeah well that thing coming out of you right now ain't good <laughs> you know that's self-pity you know well if it's self-righteous it's both self well i'm just something good to god you know what i mean i'm special you know lock him up in the ark well, ain't nothing good about me but Jesus. Self-pity. Lock him up in the ark. <laughs> Heading to the same place, you know. <clears throat> All right. So, um, it's, not, it's not the theology of a general death that he wants you to comprehend. I mean, can I say it any clearer? It's not the theology of a general death that he wants you to glory in. <laughs> he wants you to, you know, to glory in this experiential knowledge of what happened to you at the cross and what it was specifically that died. For them, general death, they don't know. They don't know how many beasts went with them. You, you know. <laughs> you faced them. You were stuck with them and had to look them in the eye and it wasn't fun. All right, so... Let's go back to Genesis real quick, and then uh, we'll probably look in um, um, Genesis 7, verse 16. And it's verse 16 says, uh, And they went in, and went in male and female of all flesh. They went in, went in. Anybody notice it repeats that? They went in, went in, male and female of all flesh. How much flesh? All flesh. Oh, darn. As God co had commanded him, notice, of all flesh as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Oh, my. Anybody get goosebumps? And the Lord shut him in with all flesh. I mean, there it is, bigger than life. 
So when the time came, Noah and his family and all the animals went into the ark, and God just shuts them up in there. And with the shutting of that door, we have not only uh, been shut out from destruction, but we've been shut out from the new creation until God himself opens the door for us to see that. So inside that ark, we're with God. Can I get amen? We are with God, but we are shut up as in a cocoon, and that's the thing that you have to realize. Now, the corresponding New Testament scripture, in my opinion, that goes along with this is found in the book of Galatians. Look over in Galatians chapter 3 with me, please. Galatians 3. In verse 23. But this is Galatians 3 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. All right. There is, uh, there are those who come to Christ and they believe in the truth but they still believe that there is something good about them and the, the only reason why someone would find the law valuable would be it would be a way to prove that there's something better about them than others or that there's something good about them to God. It's the only reason. And so... The Lord has to convince even, even people who have believed that they are saved from judgment because Noah was in that ark and believed he was saved from judgment. That there's not anything special about you and that you're not even going to enter the new creation until you realize that Jesus is the new creation and that you're not. Uh, this doesn't translate very well in Spanish but I, I have said before, Jesus is the great I am, and I'm the great I am not. Or, as I would say here in Texas, I'm the great I ain't. <laughs> um, so, um, he shuts us up, to f up. He shuts us up to faith, which should afterward be revealed. You see his heart. You see what's going on. He's not just saving you from the judgment. He's shutting you up to bring about a point in time where there is a faith. And we talked about this before. There is saving faith and there is the faith of the Son of God. This is the not saving faith we're talking about here. But this is talking about something that should afterward be revealed after you've already been shut up. Amen. Uh, uh, Galatians bears it out, and so does Noah. That this is, you're shut up to something that's going to, a faith that's going to come afterwards, and it's a faith that is based on revelation and, uh, and upon revealing, okay? So, God is the one who shuts us up and saves us from destruction, but only God can open the, the door into the reality of the new creation and he's the only one who can save us from ourselves uh, we couldn't save ourselves from the judgment and we cannot save ourselves or bring ourselves into the fullness of the revelation of Christ you can pray you can read the word you can cry you can beg I went through all of that and more I fasted I I did everything because why? I wanted the revelation of Christ. Now, notice my words. I didn't want Christ revealed. I wanted the revelation of Christ. There's a difference. The revelation of Christ became something with parentheses about it, around it, a special thing that you can enter into after you're saved. The revelation of Christ. Oh, the special people get that. It was no hard after the Lord to have the Lord revealed in me. 
It was to gain this special experience, this special thing that would put me over the hump, you know. And I, I remember clearly, I mean, that was my goal and that was my spirit in the whole thing. And so, so I, I gave everything I knew to give, you know, which is a form of being, again, under the law, trying to be special enough so that you can prove that you're really special so that he can give you this. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm telling you. And I just, so I just, you know, I mean, I just prayed all the time and I read the word and I just sought the Lord and I cried out and I went to every altar call and I, oh God, you know, I remember thinking that if I made my voice go, oh, that he'd really hear me. And if I sort of went, oh, that he would hear me more than if I went, Lord, I really need you. Do the scriptures say that if you do a little of this or your voice goes, uh, that that'll make it, that he'll go, oh man, look, they're shaking. <laughs> Holy Spirit, get in there. Help that one out. You know, he's just looking for faith and real faith. And I believe that can be exercised by, you know, drinking a Coke and joking and believe in the Lord or whatever. I mean, there's, you know, I believe that you can just be like this and just have no special anything and you just say, Lord, I just really need you right now and I, I trust your word and I believe that you want to reveal your son in me. I'm not going to try to earn this by the way how long I do anything or what I, and I'm not shutting anything down. I want to have a heart after you. Because the, you can do either, you can either be super spiritual or you can be super, you know, what is it? You can be so spiritual you're no earthly good and you can be so earthly you're no spiritual good. You can, you can just act like it doesn't matter and it does matter. God wants your heart. Your heart will manifest itself in certain ways. But don't think that those ways are gaining you that. It's your heart that's after the Lord. I want you revealed in me. Not I want the revelation of Christ so I may step among the saints. I'm telling you. And it's a sad thing. And it's a sad thing because there are certain ministries and whatever that might even promote certain aspects. Either, you know, being super spiritual acting or lack of. Neither one are right with the heart. The heart that says, oh, I do want you, Lord, and I sincerely do, and I'm not going to fake this, but on the other hand, I am going to continue. Jesus said that. If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And I remember reading the word all the time. I mean, I always had a Bible, a little Bible in my pocket, and I read the word all the time and everything. And I remember thinking at a certain juncture that if I do this, if I'm reading the word all the time, because he said, if you continue my word, you should know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But then I started realizing that there were people that were around me who were in the word all the time, and they didn't know Jesus hardly at all. They could quote scripture, but they didn't know Jesus. And then I realized that the Pharisees were in the scriptures all the time too. And so I decided I just won't get in the scriptures now. That's not a good idea. In fact, that's a bad idea. You know? Because Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. That means that people that are in the word aren't automatically free. Right? I mean, again, the Pharisees proved that. All right, so when Noah entered into that ark, the day that he entered into that dark, he, he, the ark, he was no different than any of the other sons of Adam that were on the earth. Except he'd found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, a phrase goes off in my mind all the time. Uh, at the very beginning, when he found grace and then built the ark, at the very end, remember? At the very end, he got drunk. Did anybody know that? <laughs> Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah got drunk in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm not encouraging, encouraging you to get drunk. I'm just saying you need to be established on the grace of God and the grace that will eventually reveal his son in you. All right, so he was no different except that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But in the ark, God begins to place all these limitations on us. We can't get out. We can't take a walk. We can't take a break. We're just faced constantly with this stuff. And, you know, you can get, you can get, you can get upset at the system. You know how I know that? I did it. I did it. I, I said, my God, they had, at ours, we had lights out at 10 o'clock, I think is what it was. Ten, lights out at 10 o'clock. I had to get under my covers because you couldn't have a light on where they could see it. Under my covers, it was hot. It was in Texas. We didn't have any air conditioning in the thing that we were in, and we were basically in a barn. The walls to the rooms had only went up about this high, and you could hear everything that was in here, you know. And we're in bunk beds, and I'm on and the bottom underneath in my bunk bed with my flashlight, and it's already hot under there, and the light's making it hotter, and I am sweating like crazy going, this is crazy. I came to Bible school to get in the Word, and they won't even let me get in the Word. Ah, you know, anybody see the beast? <laughs> you know? And I mean, I was... Uh, you know, and then uh, one thing after another. I mean, the, the time I would finally get some time to get into the Word, they'd come say, hey, we need some help over here with so-and-so. And you just go, are you people crazy? You hypocrites! That's what I, you know. The bad thing is I used to stand up in front of the congregation and rebuke them for all this. Yeah, we had hundreds of people in the church. I'd stand up and... This is stupid, man. We're here for you. And then I would go back to that same room, and the Holy Spirit would smite my conscience and tell me that that was not the right spirit and that that was not the Lord, and I was standing up for what's right without the, li the life that is right. My words may have been right, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but my spirit wasn't right at all, and then I'd have to go back the next service, stand up in front of them and repent to all of them. I'm sorry. I was just, I, my spirit was wrong. But why don't you let me search? No, no. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So, um, all these limitations begin to be put on you, and you, you think it's the system, but it's, it's, it is the system. It's called the ark system. <laughs> it's the ark system. It's God's special system just for you. Because he knows what's going to drive you crazy. But his goal isn't to drive you crazy, but to drive you to him it, so that it'll open you up to see how much you need Jesus and how much you need oneness with Jesus. Not just, I need Jesus, pal, friend. You know, like the Jesus movement and the hippies. That, you know, you know, me and Jesus got a good thing going. No, as long as I'm included, we got no good thing going. You know, Jesus, you're my friend. Well, you know, you're not really a friend. You don't lay down your life. I lay down my life for you, so I'm a friend, but you're not a friend. Anybody getting that? <laughs> you know? And so he had to break, he had to break up all my theology, and he had to break up all my self-righteousness, and then after he broke, because usually he breaks up your self-righteousness, and then he's got to work on your self-pity. Right? You know. Because you know, then you go, hey, you just go sit in the corner, I'll never do anything again. Well, I'd like for you to bring forth Jesus. You know, no, I'm just a mess. That's right. Why don't you just die and get it over with and let him come forth? Get up. I can't. I'm just a mess. <sighs> See, I know all these because I went through it personally. I mean, I know all this firsthand. How valuable is oneness? It's just as valuable as much as you learn how bad you are and how wonderful he is. That you're, it's at that point you're willing to live as a branch and you quit the Christian lifestyle 
and you just start living the branch lifestyle. And I mean the branch to the vine, not the branch Davidians. <laughs> Where you're plugged into him and his life and his nature and his responses and his resources and his attitudes. And you're willing to go the extra mile and you're willing to take uh, hits and accusations and things. You're willing to do that if, number one, if it will result in allowing Christ to come forth out of you and in that process dying to self, life will come out of death. Death worketh in me, Paul said, but life in you. If that can only be the case, then you're willing to do that. You're willing to go through anything. Why? Because Jesus is that way, and now you're one with Jesus, and he's living in you in the same way that he lived in him. You think he's going to live any different in that one little body he had compared to living in this body? This body of believers, or not really a body of believers, the body of Christ. He's not, he's not going to live any different. If we, if we are living for him, there's going to be some big, big, ugly differences. All right. So to, to make that leap of faith, it's going to require a whole different kind of faith than just, uh, you know, faith for salvation, <clears throat> excuse me, from destruction, faith from, for, from judgment, faith from hell, however you want to put it. Um, at this point, God begins to work a new faith in you. And it's, it is uh, because at first it was faith that involved deliverance uh, from judgment uh, and deliverance from the world and all that. But then we begin to be delivered from the wretchedness of self. Um, and we do that in a practical way. And we do that by the revelation of what the new creation really is. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God. That's not true of you. Never will be true of you. It'll only be true of him and true of you as you are one with him. And even if the fullness of that isn't working in you, it's still true of you if you are in oneness with it. Amen? That's why it's called faith in that. Because if it was just all automatic, you wouldn't need faith. It'd just be fact. Fact would kick in. But God wants your heart. God wants your trust. God wants your belief. God wants your faith. He wants you to believe that the cross happened, the destruction is over with, everything's dead, and that what you're dealing with right now is only what's alive to you, but you need to see the cross in a deeper way than a theological way that you know, that everything died and, oh, praise God, I've got the theology of it down. See, I mean, you have to be challenged on this cross thing. You have to be challenged on the faith of this. He, he didn't want just, I mean, you know, what does it say in uh, John uh, 8, you know, 29, 30, 31, right through there? It says, uh, after Jesus said these things, many of his disciples believed on him. And then Jesus said to those who believed, and that's what it says. He said these words to those who believe. If you continue in my word, you'll know. You won't just be believing. You'll know the truth. It will be part of who you are. It will be the way that you react because you will know me, and therefore you will know the right reaction. <clears throat> let this mind be in you, not let, the, let these thoughts be in you. Let, a, let, a, let me give you a thought of how to act. I mean, you know, we hunt, we're, we're hunting for the will of God like that. Folks, the nature of Christ is the will of God. First and foremost, the nature of Christ is the will of God. You could say, Jesus, go, you know, look at the Father looking at Jesus. Jesus, go do the will of God for me. Well, he's going to do it anyway. He's going to lay down his life for others. He's going to suffer for others. Right? You don't have to explain that to him. Okay, you know, that's why it took 2,000 years to talk him into it. Get it, everything clear to him. No. You know? He is 
the fulfillment of what, everything that God wanted and what the will of God really represents. So, um, so there is this necessity of being shut up to the faith that should afterwards be revealed. God is going to get more out of you than he got out of those that just perished in the judgment. He's going to get Christ out of you. Sure, he'll judge them. Oh, whoopee. You know, that maybe that'll satisfy some righteous side of him, but there's something greater at work in him than just satisfying vengeance on whoever did wrong. I mean, wouldn't you hope that our Father would be, there'd be more to it than that? And that is, he wants Christ. He created us so that Christ would be formed in us, that Christ would live his life through us. He, you know, the example I've given, and we're closing right now, but the example I give is that, you know, he looked at the angels and Lucifer, you know, fell and took, you know, one third of the angels with him. And uh, uh, so then he makes Adam and it doesn't take long. He doesn't even have any kids yet and they both fail. And he looks around at everything he's ever created, angelic creation, earth creation, human creation. He looks around at everything and says, everything has failed me. You know, I mean, he could be like us. Oh, everything has failed me. Everything. Nobody will stand with me. Nobody will. Oh, Jesus. Hey, the guy here right here on my right hand, he's never failed me, not once. Hey, I've got an idea. Let's put him in, everybody. And let him live his life and his nature, and that'll be the answer. Does it sound like a good plan? Sounds good to me. All right, let's take a break, and we'll come back.